Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining us for this segment, we have Mark Merrick, Senior Specialist with Index Research and Development at NASDAQ Investment Intelligence to discuss the Philex Semiconductor Sector Index, one of the most widely tracked indexes. Mark, it's great to see you. Welcome back to Trade Talks. Thanks, Jill. Great to be back as always. Uh, give us an overview of the constituents, industry weighting, selection criteria, all of that that goes into the methodology behind the SOX. Sure, Jill. Um, yeah, so I mean, starting with the basics, this index was launched almost 30 years ago in December of 1993. Uh, pretty incredible that we've got that long of a track record here. That is really one of the best uh, selling points of this index versus competitor products is that industry leading track record. Um, in terms of methodology, pretty straightforward. We use ICB subsector classifications to pull out uh, semiconductor subsector companies as well as production equipment. Uh, companies that that provide semiconductor designers and manufacturers the equipment they need to uh, to, to deliver their products. Um, in terms of weighting, a modified market cap uh, weighting approach where we've got the top five constituents capped at eight percent each. The rest of the index is capped at four percent, um, and we're always looking for the top thirty names. So the thirty largest. Uh, semiconductor companies with the U.S. listing that does allow international companies uh, to make it into the index, even though it's a U.S. listed index, uh, you do get some international semiconductor companies with secondary listings here on the NASDAQ or on the NYSE. Um, in terms of the top 10 companies as of March month end, you've got NVIDIA, uh, Intel, and AMD in the top five there. Um, you've got names like Texas Instruments um, and analog devices in the next five. They make up about 60% of the index weight. That is not going to change very much, again, given that top five, 8% rest of the index capped at 4% uh, weightings. You're always going to have pretty high concentration here, around 60% of the weight going to the top 10. How do you compare SOX with other benchmarks? What are the individual and industry drivers of performance? Yeah, so I mean, there, there are a couple other benchmarks out there. One is um, from uh, MBIS, uh, the index a company that kind of supports Vanek. Vanek's got a semiconductor product. Um, there's also uh, ICE Semi from uh, the parent of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, that underlies the uh, BlackRock semiconductor product. The thing here is that there really aren't that many differentiating factors. If you're, if you're talking about a U.S. semiconductor index, um, one of the differentiators is the weighting uh, applied to Taiwan Semi, uh, which is based in Taiwan, has a secondary listing in the U.S. Uh, our index doesn't assign as much of a weight to that because we use uh, listing market cap to determine the relative weights in this index. Um, whereas uh, one of our competitors uses the overall company market cap and Taiwan Semi has grown to become, uh, you know, over a half trillion dollar market cap uh, globally. So, you know, that little differences like that, uh, when you look at the actual, you know, returns for something like year to date, uh, you'll see that uh, the three of those are all very, very closely bunched together, uh, down about 13% year to date. You compare that to something like the NDX, which was down about 9% in the first quarter, a little bit of underperformance there. SPX, uh, the S&P 500 was also down in the quarter, kind of reflecting broad market weakness with those concerns around interest rates and inflation. Um, but you know, this, this all has to be put in the context of what we've seen this index deliver over the last decade, uh, decade plus really, which is really, really extraordinary returns, even better, better than the NASDAQ 100. Um, you look at what these top 10 names, for example, have done over the last one or two calendar years, uh, a lot of them doubling, uh, not just in 2021, but also in 2020, you look at names like NVIDIA that was up over 100% both years. Uh, AMD was up 100% in 2020. A lot of other names uh, really, really healthy double-digit returns. Intel, really the only one of this bunch that's been weak in the last two years, um, really kind of driven by a strong fundamental backdrop uh, in terms of pricing power for their products, in terms of the supply chain, uh, weaknesses that have just led to longer and longer delays for these products for end users, like smartphone manufacturers, like gaming system manufacturers, like auto manufacturers, right? And that's kind of setting up this competitive environment where uh, no one wants to wait very long, right? And so we think a lot of these companies have, you know, pretty 
extended uh, time horizons where they're going to be in, you know, a, a name your price type of situation. Uh, if you want to cut in front of the line uh, as an end user, you're going to have to pay up. And frankly, I think that's one of the reasons this index maybe is going to be more protected from inflationary pressures going forward, given that pricing power. A lot of these companies really kind of being standalone monopolies or duopolies in their respective niches. And Mark, with the backdrop of the global pandemic, in what ways did it accelerate the growth of the semiconductor sector? And what trends do you foresee in the next 12 months? It's, I mean, it's really work from home, I think is the biggest one, right? All of a sudden, everyone's had to have, um, you know, the same type of technology to do their, their uh, knowledge sector jobs from home adequately. That, that has led to really record demand for things like laptops, tablets, a um, lot more people having to kind of entertain themselves from home as well. That's led to a lot more demand for gaming consoles. Um, and then you look at things like the auto sector, which I mentioned, you know, traditionally has not been a big end user of semis um, with the rise of things like, um, you know, assist uh, driver assistance uh, systems, uh, things in cars that basically help you avoid accidents, right? Whether it's kind of visually looking around and seeing obstacles and potential accidents happening before they do, breaking the car automatically, adjusting the steering, things like that really didn't exist five or 10 years ago in most models. And then you've got the whole EV movement, right? Uh, when, you, when you electrify the entire vehicle, including sort of where the energy comes from, right? Instead of gas, there's a lot, a lot more that goes into um, developing a computer system, essentially multiple computer systems that uh, manage and regulate the flow of that power, um, not just to propel the car forward, but again, to operate things like those assistance systems, like, um, you know, CarPlay, the media centers, the media systems that cars now have that, uh, you know, five or 10 years ago, you just didn't have. So some of it is COVID related, right? In terms of work from home, play from home, learn from home, shop from home. Uh, a lot of it is also just kind of longer running secular trends that have taken hold that uh, show no signs of slowing down. And Mark, in the last minute here, what about assets under management? Any trends there? Any particular inflows from APAC? Yeah, I mean, I've put up two of the products tracking this index. Globally, we have quite a number of products. Uh, the one on the left is from Direction, which is a U.S. company uh, that has a portfolio of leveraged ETFs. This is the three times bull leveraged ETF, ticker SOXL. Um, you can see phenomenal rise in AUM from basically right about when that COVID pandemic hit in March of 2020. We've gone up from you know under a billion to about 6 billion in, a, in AUM now. That's despite quite a bit of weakness year to date uh, in the sector, especially when you leverage at 3X. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you've got uh, Murray's product out in South Korea, the Murray asset, Tiger, uh, U.S. Semiconductor ETF. That one launched just about a year ago. Um, so we're celebrating a one-year anniversary for that product that has already crossed USD $1 billion of AUM. Um, and very excitedly, uh, Murray's got another product coming out later this month um, that's going to be a leveraged version of, uh, of that product, tracking the same index and kind of delivering a similar result to what Direction has here in the U.S. So that's why we're kind of showing these two side by side. Great growth in both. A um, lot of excitement around the sector, not just short term with what's been happening with COVID, but long term, given some of those secular trends I told you about. All right, Mark, we appreciate the insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.